Hey guys, this is uh, really part two of the uh, video I posted earlier today, How to Abide in Christ. Um, I just broke it in half because I know if you're like me, sometimes I just don't have the time. You know, I could be the best speaker in the world uh, and I'll even cut them in half uh, and say, oh, I'll watch the rest later and you get busy and you forget. So these are two important teachings. I think this video is the meat of the teaching. So you don't want to miss this, but if you didn't see the first one, go back and watch uh, How to Abide in Christ. Uh, but before you do anything, remember this. If you are buying or selling real estate, if you're in need of a mover, if you're in need of a mortgage company, legal services, practically any kind of professional that has to do with moving, uh, we can help you out. Go to realestateforlife.org and not only will you get the cream of the crop professionals in their field, you'll be assured that every penny that you pay will go to pro-life people. It will go to pro-life professionals that have committed to donate part of their profits to pro-life organizations. So don't forget, realestateforlife.org. Tell them Blue Collar Catholic sent you. So we're going to continue, <coughs> excuse me, in my uh, One Say Though We Save Protestants Friends Least Favorite Chapter, Chapter 15 in the Gospel of John. And we're going to go right where we left off, uh, verse 8 through 17. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So in part one, Christ is telling us, abide in me and I'll abide in you. And then we went back a few chapters and seen what that meant in John 6.56 says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will abide in me, and I will abide in you. Here he's saying, abide in my love. Well, how do you do that? He tells us, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So what are his commandments? Well, we know the two most important ones, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you do those things, you're abiding in Christ's love. These things I have spoken to you. Why? So you could be heavy burdened following the law? No. That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Following Christ isn't always easy. We have to pick up our cross and follow him. But following Christ, there's joy. And joy is different than happiness. Happiness is based on your circumstance. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from abiding in Christ. It comes from abiding in Jesus' love. And no matter what the circumstance, you can find joy in the journey. Because we know the ultimate end to our journey. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can comprehend what Christ has prepared for us. So there's always joy. Sometimes we, we can't find it, but it's there. Abide in his love and you will know his joy and your joy, his joy will be complete in you. And then he goes on, this is my commandment. So he's talking about how to abide in his love, that you love one another as I have loved you. So now he's taking it even deeper. So in, in, General Christianity, basic one-on-one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind is commandment number one. Love your neighbor as yourself, number two. But then he's telling them, greater love, oh, I'm sorry, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So he's telling his disciples, the church, he's telling us, Christians, and, and I would include my separated Protestant brothers as well. He's calling us to love one another the way he loved us. Sacrificial, agape love. 
the love that you die for somebody. That's what he's telling us. And then he even says it, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if, if you do what I command you. Abraham was the first person in the Bible that Jesus called friend. But Abraham did what he commanded him to do. He was willing to sacrifice his son, even though he didn't have to. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are running around saying, oh, I'm a friend of Jesus, I'm a friend of Jesus. But they refuse, and they don't even give Jesus a thought of what he wants them to do. He's saying here, it's, it's you know, it's a quid pro quo, you know. You're my friends if... You just, oh, you're not my friend, you know. You are my friends if you say the sinner's prayer. No. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He chose us when we were wretched sinners. That's why we're crazy in love with Jesus. No greater love has any man has ever seen than the love of Jesus. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you. To love one another. This is a command for us Christians. We are to love one another. And I think if you go to John chapter 21, 15 through 17, Jesus obviously is our Lord and King. He is God. He's the one true God, consubstantial with the Father. But while he was a human being on earth, he showed us how to love one another. How one brother should love another brother. Right here. This was after Peter denied Christ three times. John 21, 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love him, love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Now, if you remember, going all the way back in Matthew uh, chapter 16, Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, which means rock. And he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter ran around like Rocky, thinking he could take everybody out. And he quickly found out that he was a weak, mortal man. And he denied Christ three times. So now Peter's feeling pretty cruddy. He's probably thinking, there's no way Jesus wants me to lead his church now. If anything, he'd want John. You know, John was the only disciple, the apostle that stayed with Jesus when he was crucified. I deserted him and denied him three times. But Jesus still has, still has a plan for Peter. See, because when Jesus has a plan for us, he know, already knows we're going to fail and he already knows when we're going to be weak. He's not looking at today. He's looking at the completed picture. He's looking at who you truly are in Christ when you are made perfect and complete. He knows we're all incomplete now and we're weak. You know, I have a son who has his own law firm. I'm very proud of him. Uh, he went through college and law school at the same time of having a wife and, and having three children. And... Um, they felt called, like my wife and I, that the, his wife should stay home with the children. And um, long story short, he had to work a full-time blue-collar job. He was a rigger, a hard physical job, and went to college full-time. And I'm so proud of him that he's a lawyer. He made it. I always tell him I really admire him. But, you know, in high school, he, was got, he got in a lot of trouble. You know, my wife and I felt called, even though we were too... You know, if, you, if you've seen my videos in the past, you know, I was juvenile delinquent. My wife and I were high school dropouts. But Christ changed us, and we felt the conviction to homeschool our kids. 
and, and we homeschooled him through sixth grade. And when he went to, out to school, he was way above his peers. It was amazing. And I always gave my wife credit for all success because as a blue collar guy with the wife staying home, you know, you got to work 70, 80 hours a week, you know, this, this is the way it is. So I always gave her all the credit and I still give her all the credit. But when he passed his law, his bar exam, he said something that, uh, that really blessed me. He said, <coughs> you know, like I said, he got in a lot of trouble in high school. He actually got expelled and we had to go back to homeschool <laughs> his last year. But uh, I laugh about it now. It wasn't, it wasn't very funny then. We were, we were heartbroken and we were like, God, what is going on? We were confused young parents and, and it hurt like heck. But he said, remember, that? and so he was expelled and he was always getting in trouble with the law. And he said, he said, you know, the one time we were in, in the court waiting on our uh, lawyer, you said to me, uh, you know, Ryan, you would make a great lawyer. He said, ever since that day, I started thinking I'm going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and he said, you know, you didn't condemn me. You didn't tell me what a horrible person I was. I'm never going to make it anywhere. You still had full faith and confidence in me that I was this smart kid that could be a lawyer. And that, that those spoken words changed my whole outlook like yeah I need to get it together and go become a lawyer and he did praise the Lord so what we say to our children and what we say to our brothers and sisters has an effect you know think about your words you know how is this going to affect this person in the long term so Jesus is saying feed my lambs like you're still the rock that I'm going to build my church on and then he says to him um, a second time, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter looked at him and said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he says again, tend my sheep. In other words, you got a job to do, you know? You know, like Tom Brady, he could be down by three touchdowns and he's just always looking to win. And uh, this is how our, our attitude's got to be. Okay, we fell, we went to confession, God forgave us, but what is God's plan for you? Whatever it is, you need to do it because Jesus is expecting you to do it. And then he says to him, tend my sheep. Then he says to Peter a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was grieved. He said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, man. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. A couple interesting things were happening there. He denied Jesus three times. Jesus basically forgave him three times. Brought it, he was brought to his attention. And Jesus was saying, I don't care. I know you denied me three times, but you still have a job to do. And I still have faith that you are the rock that I created. But another interesting thing is in the Greek, the first two times Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? He used the sacrificial word agape love. There's like three or four words you can use for love in the Greek. But Peter responded with like a friendship love. Like, I love you like a friend or a brotherly love. I love you like a brother. Jesus asked him a second time, do you love me with agape love? Are you willing to die for me, basically? And Peter's like, I love you like a friend, Lord. And you wonder, why would he say that? Well, the third time, he says to Peter, do you love me? He uses that friendship. Do you love me like a friend, Peter? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter tells you why. He says, Lord, you know everything. Basically, you know I denied you three times. I'm not capable yet of dying for you. Of course, I love you like a brother. So number one, Jesus knows our hearts. He knows the love we're capable. Peter was not capable of dying for Christ yet. But Jesus knew one day he would be, and he was. But Jesus accepted him. And that's how we're to love our brothers and sisters or our spouses. There may be maybe times where you don't feel like they're loving you the way they should. But hey, you have to understand, they may not be capable 
You know, if, if, you, if you're ever a Gary Smalley love language, there's different love languages. They may not even know how to love you in your love language. They're loving you in their language the best they can. You know, or you don't, you don't, maybe God just hasn't brought them to that place where they can love you with agape love. But he calls us to love them with agape love. And if you can't, you have to say, Jesus, you know, I love you. You know, I love them, but you know everything. Help me to love them like you do. Help me to love them with agape love. And once Christ fills your heart and you abide in Christ and he abides in you, when you abide in his love and his love abides in you, miraculous things can happen and great things throughout the church. You know, a great example of the love of Christ was during World War II. And in spite of what fake news says about the Catholic Church, this is a historical fact that the Jewish leaders at that time said the Catholic Church, Pope Pius especially, at the time was the Pope of the Catholic Church during World War II, saved more Jews from death than all the Allied forces combined. Historians today estimate the Catholic Church saved 800,000 Jews from being exterminated by the Nazis. That's love. That is love because they didn't do it with power. They had to be careful. The Pope had to be careful what he said. He couldn't say anything really bad about uh, Hitler or Hitler would come against them with a vengeance and kill everybody. So the Pope had to work a fine line. But that didn't stop him from loving the Jews. The Pope hit 2,000 Jews in his home, his personal home. Thousands more at the Vatican. Priests throughout all of Europe were hiding Jews in their churches. This one Holy Father was caught and was sent to Auschwitz and um, all the eyewitnesses from that time said he was a holy priest he was a loving priest and because he was such a loving priest and so kind to everybody including his guards the guards got angry would beat him severely and they would give him less food than everybody else who was just getting merely enough to survive and yet that priest would share that food with the other prisoners and then one day one day Three of the prisoners escaped. So the Nazi guard came in and said, well, three of your prisoners escaped. We're going to kill three of you by starvation. You, you, and you, come with me. You're going to the starvation bunker. And the rest of you can watch them starve to death. One man cried, what about my wife and my children? And this holy priest, this father in the church, had the love of Christ that he was abiding in so powerful, he was compelled to say, I will die in his place, please. Let me die in this man's place. There's no greater love than a man lay down his life for a friend. So this holy priest went down into the bunker where they starved him to death. And one of the eyewitnesses said he was tasked with going in and taking the bucket that they were supposed to uh, pee and poop in. And um, he said the bucket was always empty because all they didn't eat. So all they expected them to do was urinate and... They were so thirsty that they would drink their urination. This is how these people suffered. I mean, it was a suffering, suffering death. But the eyewitnesses said they always seen this holy father, this holy priest praying with all the, soul, all the prisoners in there and comforting them even as he was suffering. He was comforting with the love of Christ that he received. See, because you can't give what you don't receive. You have to receive the love of Christ. And then they say, after everybody died, they came in and told the priest, well, you know, we need this bunker for something else. And the priest just willingly put out his arm and they gave him a shot of poison and he died. That priest is named St. Maximilian Colby. And he was an ordinary man that abided in Christ's love. We can do extraordinary things, but you can say, I can never do that. And I don't know if I could do that. You know, Keith Green, the late Keith Green had a song, The Grace of God, and he said, like Peter, I can't even watch him pray for an hour, I fall asleep, and I bet I could deny you too. But like Peter, Jesus knows what we're capable. But whatever you're capable of doing, ask the Lord to increase that, but do something. You know, I always like telling this great story of a Protestant minister named Tony Campola, just a real outgoing, funny uh, Italian guy, and uh, 
he was going to speak in Hawaii, and he said he flew to Hawaii, had jet lag, so he's walking around looking for a place to get a coffee. It's like midnight. He sees a donut shop. He goes in and gets a coffee and a donut, and he sees all these prostitutes come in, and they were talking about one of their girlfriend's birthday, and they're like, oh, yeah, can you believe she's going to be 30 already? Wow, you know, we're getting old, and they're... And so Tony Compola, compelled by the love of Christ, says, hey, how about we have a birthday party for her? And they're like, what? They're like, her birthday's tomorrow night. You're going to be here tomorrow night? He goes, yeah, I'll come back. I'm here for a couple days. So they're like, okay. He goes, I'll bake a cake. So the next day, he buys the stuff, and he bakes like a Dunkin' Highs cake or something. It says, happy birthday. Uh, I think her name was uh, Rose. It's like, happy birthday, Rose. Put a nice rose on it. And then uh, the girl's like, oh, this is cool. You're funny. You're a funny old guy, you know? And they're waiting for her to walk in that evening. And they, she walks in the diner because they always meet up in the diner for some coffee. And they all yell, surprise, happy birthday. And then uh, Tony Compola hands her the birthday cake and says, blow out the candles. And he said, this woman looked at her and just tears just, <coughs> tears just flowed out of her eyes. She took the cake. And she ran out, and they're like, what's up with that? So she came back, he's like, hey, what you doing with my cake? And she's like, I'm turning 30 today, and that's the first time in my life that anyone has ever given me a birthday cake. I'm going to put that in my freezer and keep it forever. Why would you do that? You don't even know me. And he says, well, I know Jesus Christ loves you. And if Jesus loves you, I love you. And I would think that he wants me to let you know how much you're loved. And that girl just bawled. And he never goes on and tells whatever became of her. You know, he didn't live in Hawaii, but he planted a seed of God's love because he was abiding in love. So you don't have to be a St. Maximilian Colby and die, but you could be a Tony Campolo, some goofy old Italian guy and bake a cake and change someone's life forever. That woman will never be the same, I promise you. But, like I said, if you've never received love, you can't give it. So I invite you to run back home. If you're a baptized Catholic that hasn't been in church, run back home. Run, kick open those confession doors. Confess your sins and receive the love of God. And then go receive the Eucharist and abide in Christ as he abides in you. And let the joy of Christ fulfill your life. Because you know what? We're only on this earth maybe 80, 90 years. If you're a Jack LaLanne, you know, might live longer and healthier. But we'll be in eternity forever. So let's plan for our eternity retirement. Not for this retirement. This we keep working. This we work to the day we die. We evangelize. We witness. But how we do it is by sharing the love of Christ that Christ showed us. That he died for us while we were yet sinners. So who are we not to love a prostitute who's never had a cake, baker, a darn cake. So, that's my message for today. And as always, stay Catholic.